Well, well, well. Hello, friends. Welcome to the Kings of Anglia podcast. It is the Monday morning after the Saturday night before the demolition man is no more. He's now part of the rubble. He helped create at Ipswich Town, trademark Stuart Watson. Paul Cook has gone. He was sacked as Ipswich Town manager on Saturday night after his side's turgid nil-nil draw in the FA Cup with League Two strugglers Barrow. And here we are again. Welcome along to another Kings of Anglia podcast where we break down a departing manager, the latest in a string of issues with managers at Ipswich Town. I am Mark Heath. With me, the two men who were up late Saturday night, breaking it all down and looking at what's next. And that's essentially what we're going to do here today. We're going to talk about what's happened and we'll talk about what's next. So first of all, Stuart Watson, Andy Warren, how are you, my friends? Did you get a little bit of time to relax yesterday, Stewie, after your hectic Saturday night? Yeah, Christmas decorations are are up, or the trees up anyway. So that was that was yesterday, and um, we go again. We go Hashtag again. New era. <laughs> Today is Part another day. <laughs> three. What are we on now? I don't, I don't know. I've lost track. Uh, I've also lost track of how many managers you've seen off now, Stewie, because you've you've outlasted quite a lot of them now. Um, Hutchie, how are you this morning? This Monday morning. This would be my th- this new manager will be my fifth, and I've only I've only uh, I've only been here since twenty seventeen. You've worked quickly. Right then, boys, let's let's waste no more time with general banter. Um, Paul Cook has left on Saturday night. I don't think I think it's fair to say you may you may disagree with me, but I think it's fair to say none of us saw that coming. Um, when I saw the tweet, my first reaction was, "This is a troll account. This is one of those people that spend time making things look as close as possible." Um, and then you clearly click on the link, and it was very much not a troll. It was very much happening. Um, and so I swore quite loudly, and my Saturday night was was not what it was meant to be, much to the chagrin of the wife. Anyway, boys, uh, same can be said for you, of course. Um, I think, Stu, you were just on your way heading out of the office to go home, and then things changed quickly. Yeah, I was, was, I was lucky it caught me, actually. <laughs> Andy and I left the ground, and as we do, we walk through town together. And we get to a point where we kind of part ways as Andy heads to, to his home, and I was heading back to the office to, to jump in my car and drive home. And the very last thing we said to each other is I said to Andy, is he going to last the season, Andy? And I can't remember what your answer was to me. I think you pulled a bit of a face. I think there was a long reply. And uh, that was the last thing we said to each other. Anyway, the answer was he didn't last more than 10 minutes because <laughs> before I'd got to my car, the announcement was made. I can't remember what you said, Andy, and I don't know if you want to... Yeah. What, what I, did you say? What I said was, uh, yes... <laughs> it, yeah and that and that's how it felt at the time and um but a, su- a surprising announcement maybe not a, a shock announcement but i think none of us really knew what this this new ownership where their where their line in the sand was where their tipping point was and 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 now we know and it's it's quite quite early isn't it um 20 league games in he's not had a full season would he have turned it around we will, we will never know. Um, interesting times. Mm. Now you've had a, a bit of time to reflect. There is a there is a snap verdict which you recorded on Saturday night for your kind of instant reaction. Um, actually, but now you've had a, a day or so to get your head around it. How, how are you feeling about it? How does it sit with you? Is it the um, right decision? Well, that, that's the other thing. The, the second time Stu and I parted ways on, on Saturday night, Stu, yeah. Stu asked me another question. And this question was, was, was this the right call? Yeah, and my, my answer to that was mm, <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, it, yeah, I think it's. I would say this has come, um, being arbitrary about it, like a month earlier than I thought it it might. Mm. I think had the Charlton and Wigan games not not gone the way that Paul Cook would have hoped. I think real, real serious. Um, sort of real serious talk among among ourselves and fans would have started um and then it would have been a a, a lot less shocking to me um but i think we all felt it was heading edging that way it just the train got to the station a bit earlier than than we thought mm. you know when you part when you part ways do you have a little hug and maybe a little gentle peck on the cheek i like to say that <laughs> <laughs> 
Yes. <laughs> yes. Stewie, um, how about you then? A, a day has passed now since it's happened, really. Um, you, you said there it tells us a lot about the new owners. And, and we had a few people, actually, uh, obviously quite a bit of fan reaction um, Saturday night and since, saying it makes them feel quite uneasy, um, this this move. Because there's, there's an Ipswich way, isn't there? It always has been. Managers are given time and trusted uh, and you know they, there's a certain way of playing etc cetera, etc cetera. and that very much seems now not to be the case perhaps under these new owners um yeah i mean this the ipswich are now looking i think for their 19th permanent manager in the club's entire history yeah like looking back through i think by the time they got to burley it was only manager number 10 um obviously hearst lasted 15 games or, or whatever that was cook now is 44 matches and didn't get an entire season. I guess that will always feel a little bit uneasy when a manager doesn't even get sort of a, a full body of work, a full season to look at. And Cook will will be absolutely fuming now, I'm sure, because he will say that his track record suggests that he's had slow starts at previous clubs and it's always come good, spectacularly so. Three titles at three different clubs. I guess he'll feel that a lot of the noises from the hierarchy about time and patience and all those sort of things have not been adhered to. But also, I kind of feel like those traditions of the Ipswich past, are, are we being a bit sort of too sentimental about those? Is that sort of, is that is the Ipswich way a bit too nice? Is it mm. about time that Ipswich kind of got a bit more ruthless and decisive there'd be an argument that Ipswich of maybe Marcus Evans who tried to adhere to those principles of, of giving managers times maybe clung on a bit too long and there comes a point where you kind of think it's one thing sort of sticking by trusting the process and sticking by a project but if you can't if you can if you've assessed all the evidence and felt like it's only heading in one direction then then why wait why drag out the inevitable and that ultimately is is what they've come to. And, and just finally, I will just say on a human level, whatever, whether you think this is right or wrong, I do, you know, I always feel for Paul Cook because he's a, you know, he was a passionate man. He's a, he's a, this is a phrase we hear a lot. He's a football man, a football man to the core though. And he's someone that watches football games for fun, back to back all day, every day. He went to Gateshead the night before this match, jumped on a train after training, went up to Gateshead to watch, to watch Charlton, probably wishes he, he hadn't bothered now, but um, he he poured his heart and soul into this. He was <clears> desperate <throat> to deliver for for these Ipswich fans, and um, he'll be hurting right now. And I'm I'm sure he'll he'll come back, and and I'm sure he'll be a success further down the line. But um, for Ipswich, they've got uh, it's time to move on. Mm, and we'll get to that in due course. Uh, it's rare, isn't it, that you get something like this happen, which has so genuinely divided people. I haven't seen that kind of one overriding emotion among fans has been um people saying yeah happy he's gone a lot of people saying like i said that it makes me feel a bit uneasy some people saying it's absolutely ridiculous it's too early and someone tweeted me and i think summed it up said it's it's harsh it's fair and it's too soon all at the same time and it does kind of feel like that um yeah. Hutchie, when you look at paul's record you take passion you take empathy and feeling out of it his record was not good 44 no. games 13 only 13 wins he, he came in to an Ipswich town side last season that was on the edge of the playoffs and and made them worse this season he hand-picked the cream of players in league one built a squad completely got rid of, of the old team which he didn't like clearly Not, didn't like any of the players didn't fancy any of the players brought in a lot of his own players players he loves you know Sam Morsey Lee Evans people like that and they're 11th in league one they're actually doing worse than they were this time last season so if you look at it like that, it's a fair decision, isn't it? Yeah, I, I would agree with going back slightly. I'd agree with what you just said a minute ago about bit, all of those emotions being, yeah. being mixed together as one. I think that's exactly where I am with it. Um, I like what in theory is Paul Cook football. Uh, I like Paul Cook um, and I really wanted to see it work. But that that record of 13 wins, crucially 14 losses to, to have lost more games than you've won as, as an, as an Ipswich town manager, isn't, isn't good enough mm. as an Ipswich town manager who took over a team who are on a run of three successive victories, seventh, really looking like they could motor towards the playoffs. That wasn't good enough either. And then mm. like you say, to have rebuilt a team in your own image um, and to still have a, 
what the Americans would say a losing record um, isn't isn't good enough. Um, that start to the season will always, I think, Paul Cook had only really started acknowledging how bad that was in the last couple of weeks and how how much it was. I think hamstrung was the mm. the um, the expression he used a couple of times, and 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 that that was it really. I, I, had they got off to a better start to this season, we wouldn't be in this situation right now where we're talking about about Paul Cook being gone at the start of December. Maybe because... even if they just won a couple of these cup games last week, mm. we might not be having this conversation now. I mean, mm. ultimately, that's probably what's been the final nail in the coffin. I'm sure the Rotherham game might have been the first moment where the the, the, the thoughts or the, the wheels started to move. Um, but they've played four teams in League Two this season and not won any of them. They've played two under-21 sides and not won either of those as well. Like the body of evidence was was starting to stack up, wasn't it? The 10, 10 times they failed to win from mm. winning positions. That's not, you know, that we're not talking once or twice off. We were talking sort of recurring, recurring themes and added to this kind of sense that the system was too rigid. There was no plan B, wasn't able to kind of manage situations within games that we weren't seeing nearly half a season in what the strongest team was. All, all of those things were starting to add up and, you know, if it was a scale, if there was some scales there and all the good stuff, as Andy says, about attacking football that was more enjoyable to watch and him just being refreshingly passionate and honest, all that good stuff was starting to just get out, outweighed by all that all that bad stuff. And uh, where was the tipping point? Well, now now we know they've decided to be... I mean, these, these guys in America have, you know, I'm sure at that, that level of business, you have to be decisive and you have to act quick before before things get worse and that's that's what they've decided I'm, I'm sure some of what Paul Cook was wanting to do going towards January maybe came into their minds I think from what I gather he was looking to in this pursuit for some more consistency I think his answer would have been to go for players that he's worked with before people like Che Dunkley people like Nathan Byrne was that a bit of a red flag to people that you can't just keep searching for things that worked for you in the past as a bit of a backward look? He's already done that with, with Lee Evans, who hasn't been playing particularly well recently. And Sam Morse, he's, he's done OK, but I didn't think he was great at the weekend. But the answer can't always be just to go to your former players. And, and maybe that was a, a red flag in terms of his ideas for, for how to fix it as well. Maybe they just didn't see that that there was an obvious solution within Paul Cook I don't know but um mm. that's where we're at mm. I think I think the point that, that you mentioned there that we don't know what his best team is I think that's a really big a big issue for for December because if you you can have all, all the faith that you want in the world and belief that Paul Cook could have been the man to to get it right but if 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 there's no kind of clear pathway forward towards getting it right like you've you, again you've said there about about the January plans he doesn't know what his best team is, even at this stage. You that that limits what trust you can have in in him to suddenly get it right because it's not like it doesn't feel like we were getting close to seeing it getting right. It was drifting away, wasn't it? It was getting further further from mm. from from being right. It, we were talking on Saturday night about the, that Wickham game. Really, wasn't that long ago? But in the time since then, it's it, it's drifted. It's really drifted, and. Um, I think a heart overhead, a head over heart. Sorry, just <clears throat> de de decision has been made by by the ownership and and Mark Ashton to cut that off before it drifts drifts any further and and sort of almost allow a, a reset at a time when, while still a horribly tough task from this point, um, the season mm. isn't isn't dead. Yeah, um, we're at now or never stage. Probably we're getting mm. towards that stage of the season. So you know, they, it was either. Either give it. It was the the decision was either ride it out and give him the rest of the season, or do something now. And that that's obviously what they've decided. Also, we need to acknowledge, as much as they kind of said, "Oh, Paul Cook was our number one choice too." He was a Marcus Evers appointment, and we'll never truly know whether that was that was the, was the case. Um, will we? I think they there was probably mm. some other other candidates in in their mind at the time. The new ownership who who ultimately weren't in charge that that happened what five six weeks later the mm. the takeover and Paul Cook's first reaction was was one of nerves when there was a takeover. 
Um, and they sort of said, oh, we reassured him straight away he was number one. We'll, we'll never know if that was that was the case or not. Hmm. I'd always be very concerned about that the first man in, in in kind of a new era, a big new reset of a football club. David Moyes is the the big one, the first man into Sir Alex Ferguson's shoes after that. Obviously, we know how that went. Um, Eddie Howe, I worry about now, the first man in in the the new era at Newcastle. I, I, I'm never entirely convinced that's a good place, a good place to be. Uh, be the first the first man to jump in is um is quite fraught. Um, and I think Paul Cook might have. Might have been <coughs> we a also need to that. acknowledge actually that the results ultimately is what's done for Paul Cook, but was. The relationship between sort of Ashton and and a, and down to to Paul Cook working perfectly in unison. We could, I don't know how much we can read into James Norwood's tweets over the weekend, but you know, sort of saying that I can't remember the phrase he used, but sort of working against certain constraints or with a, with an arm behind his back and said his hands were tied was the tweet. Yeah, I, I mean, we know that James Norwood uh, was sidelined because of a because that was a decision from. From the top rather than from from the manager so if that's one one situation where cook wanted to potentially involve someone he, he kind of dodged every time we asked about james norwood he could he quickly moved on from that so you know there may have been i'm not saying that that was a completely broken fractious relationship but if um mm. you know that that might have just been another layer on top on top of the results as well mm. andy we've spoken a little bit about the owners that they've referred <clears throat> previously to having a healthy impatience to get the job done can we take from this though that rather than healthy impatience they have an impatience generally they they want to get promoted this season they, they seem to have put quite a lot of um, eggs in that basket and um, they're clearly successful men um and yeah that, that's what they that's what they want for Ipswich Town this season there's no messing around yeah I, I think I always took that to be what a healthy <laughs> impatience was um mm. Uh, this isn't. He's he's had three times longer than Paul than Paul Hurst had. That was obviously a, that was a very very short managerial reign. That overall he hasn't had a full season, but forty four games is exceptionally close to a a full league season. So in terms of the impatience side of things, um, I I would still describe what they've done as being healthy. Um, and and yes, uh. As much as you can say the right things about, yeah, we they are here for the long haul. They can say all of that. If you're starting a new sort of a new project like this, and you you want some real momentum to get started and promotion from League One at the first time of asking with the with the the levels of of um, incoming player that have come, that that was the aim. They wanted to win the league. Mm. Um, so. Yes, I think it is a to answer your question. Yes, I think it's a definite sign of what that healthy impatience really means, and and, and what the um what the targets are for the football club. Mm. What does it mean to you? A word for the players left behind. Paul Cook's brought in nineteen players over the summer. Completely changed the squad. A lot of them are his players, um, as we say in football. Sam Morsey, Lee Evans, Connor Chaplin, people like that. Um, obviously, we know Sam's tweeted about it. Connor's tweeted about it, saying they let him down essentially. But what will this mean for them? Do you think because you've been brought into a club where you you know you are essentially the, the, the manager's choice, and now that manager's gone. I'm sure there'll be <clears throat> a bit of apprehension on several several of their behalfs. Um, these players have signed three, four year contracts in in some cases. They'll be wondering what's next for them. As whenever there's a change of manager, they'll they'll fancy some. They won't fancy others. Crucially, they'll be back to make those changes. It's not always the case that a manager might come in and think, I don't really want them, but I, there's not a lot I can do to change it. I think the ownership has, has proven that, uh, that I, I think they'll quite happily sort of wipe their nose of, of some of this this money. I mean, this normally financial reasons is what maybe holds back an ownership of, of making this these sort of changes because it's going to cost a a pretty penny to, by the time you've paid off Cook, Paul Cook, by the time you've paid off all of his coaching staff, by the time you've maybe then had to back the new manager to bring in some of their own players and move on some of the ones that you've just signed, it's going to cost a fair bit of money. But it tells you 
the sort of money in the pot. I, I imagine the, the sort of level that they're dealing at at the moment is small fry when we're talking about the sort of billions in this pension pot. It was, it's only when they get, hopefully, when we get to the championship at some point that the money then becomes big at the moment that they're they're able to kind of make make these calls but um no these the, I'm sure there'll be some players a bit a bit worried and are probably feeling as some of them have tweeted that they've let they've let Paul Cook down because they they liked they you know there was a lot of respect there for Paul Cook and um it's always the manager that's the fall guy but um quite often in football we've said this before there's there's so much spotlight on a manager and the players get away scot free don't they hmm. okay then boys that's what's happened <clears throat> Paul Cook has left Ipswich Town. I don't want to spend ages eulogising about Cook because clearly it's happened. Whatever we say, it's happened. He's gone. Is, is there anything you want to say, kind of final word wise, on, on Paul Cook, Andy, the Paul Cook era at Town? Um, how, how will he be remembered? I, I, I think he'll just be re he'll be remembered as demolition man, won't he? He'll be the man yeah. that broke that broke it all down. Um, and ho hopefully, hopefully that demolition proves to be the ground, the sort of the groundwork for for future success it's just a, a shame that a shame for Paul that he's not the man at at the helm at the helm of that mm. yeah you, demolition man the, is the phrase that's always going to be held above him and as much as we're talking about this maybe being really harsh on Paul Cook I'm sure a lot of the players that were discarded in sort of quite rapid and ruthless fashion by him will say that's the business you know he's been, one one minute he's the executioner the next minute he's He's the one losing his head, and that's it's. Um, I think Joe Royal used the phrase: "It's a beautiful game, or great game, shit business." And that's uh, and that's that's football, isn't it? So um, he, as Paul says, he's been he's experienced enough to know to know how it works. I think he knew that he was under pressure because he wasn't. No one was really asking him about. Do you fear for your job? Are you worried that you need to get results? Mm. He was the one that kind of kept taking his press conferences into the realms of you know, or managers these days, the way people talk about them, the way people chop and change is ridiculous. I think he was feeling that pressure from Mark Ashton. And let's let's be honest, Mark Ashton's under a fair bit of pressure himself. You know, that pressure is filtering right down from the very top. And Mark Ashton will also be feeling that pressure. And he's under pressure to get this next recruitment bang on. Mm, perfect segue, Stewie. Before we move on, the demolition man has become part of the rubble. I'll say it again because it was such a nice line. Trademark Stuart Watson. Right then, boys. The truly sexy stuff now is what happens next. Who's coming in? That's all we care about now. Um, we're expecting a caretaker manager to be announced today ahead of the trip to Charlton tomorrow. Mark Ashton, in, in the brief quotes the club put out in that statement on Saturday night, said there is no one lined up and the extensive search has begun for the next manager. First of all, I don't believe him. I, I do not believe that this is a knee-jerk reaction. This is not a man who does anything without planning it fully. It's a man who lives his life by data dashboards. Um, so I can't believe they haven't got some idea of who they'd like to come in now. Um, Hutchie, am I being am I being too facetious there? I think there might be a, a stretching of the truth with language <laughs> there in that. In that, I'm, Look, I, I feel sure he knows... By, but there may not be a man with a, a pen ready to sign a contract, but um, this isn't. I, I I feel sure that Mark Ashton hasn't rocked up at the the training ground this morning. Um, right then, lads. Who, yeah, who, bloody should, bloody who, who should we get? <laughs> um, I, I, he's a football he's a man that works of, ahead. Yeah, we've we've seen this. Uh, anyone in football that suggests that that's how it works is is naive in the extreme. It's football is full of. Um, Little whisperers. What is it in Game of Thrones? The uh, sparrows. Yeah, the little sparrows that are. That, it's not always a direct call, but uh, somebody's agent calls somebody else's agent. If this job were to become available, would your client potentially be interested? You know, they know, they know who, who, who would be up for it in advance, and now, um, mm. and now it's a case of. Um, sort of sorting through that and deciding who, who they want to interview and, and uh, taking it from there. OK, well, let's deal with the first the first question then. Caretaker manager, that's likely to be announced today. We're expecting it to be John McGreal, Stewie? I think it's going to be a combination of John McGreal and Kieran Dyer from, from what I gather. It's um, the timing of John being announced on Thursday, mm. the day after the West Ham game. John McGreal, who's kind of been about the club for several months now. We see him at all the games. Obviously, 
He lives locally. Um, he's been about the training ground. He's, he's a good mate of Paul Cook's as well. So he, he's appointed to this kind of... For months, they were never able to kind of find him a role. And then on Thursday, they suddenly find him this role assisting Kieran Dyer with the 23s and quite vague sort of developmental role. And then two days later, Paul Cook is sacked and it looks like John McGrill uh, is going to is going to be caretaker manager. So um, I think Paul Cook on, fr on Friday, he was asked about, Mag you know, is McGrill's role potential to get involved with the first team? And he will see, we'll let him get his feet under the table. And <laughs> a day later, Cook's gone and McGrill's kind of leapfrogged him into, into the hot seat. So that's all a, a little bit strange. Um, I'm pleased that, that uh, I'm hopeful that Kieran will be involved as well because John has kind of come in as an outsider Whereas Kieran's had his feet under the table for a long time, and he'll have he'll have he worked with the first team quite a lot at the back end of last season when Paul Cook first came in, um, uh, and he's a he's a, a very highly thought of coach as well. And these are crucially two men that that know this football club, that care about this football club, and will hopefully kind of inject a bit of feel good factor into these uh, into these next few games because they need to get these next. I think we at least these next two games, Charlton and Wigan away. They need to get something out of these to make sure that the new man has got some sort of feel-good factor to ride into the uh, into the big festive fixtures. Mm. And it would be perfect, wouldn't it? Pack out Portman Road, Sunderland at home, December the 18th. That would be the perfect game to unveil the new man taking the club forward. Hutch, you put together what is already the most read thing we, we've done this month, the potential list of candidates to be the next town boss on Saturday night. Um, just talk a little bit about some of the names there any that that kind of catch your eye any that you desperately would not like to see as town boss there's it, it was split up into sections so the, but the sec the kind of the section on there that that catches my eye I, I actually quite like some of the some of the league one managers that the Ipswich would be in a position to try and prize prize away I think that interests me so there was, there was a section on league one bosses former favorites which obviously got Tony Mowbray in it tried tried and tested headed by by Neil Warnock which has got people talking and, and others other such managers like that John McGrew and Kieran Dyer as the in-house options and then there's kind of the glamour names of, of Frank mm -hmm. Lampard that that kind of thing that obviously people are drawn to immediately but it's the top section in there that, that interests me that the league one league one bosses um sort of a, a younger a younger head coach because I, I really think we, we could be about to see sort of something a little bit fresh for Ip, for Ipswich anyway in terms of what the appointment is. I think it's going to be a head coach kind of figure. I wouldn't be surprised if that was the title that was given to the, the next man rather than rather than manager. Um, sim simply because you just look at the structure that's being built at the football club. I think Mark Ashton has had head coaches before at Bristol City. There's Andy Rolls in there who has a very big role to play at the football club. He's that performance director. They've got uh, Prober in there. Um, they're building a structure which I think the next coach is going to have to kind of feed into. So it's almost like a system man who's staying in your lane, coach the team and um, and um, and do your job from there. So. I'll be honest. the the one that the one that really interests me from from the list that I, I put together is Liam Manning at MK Dons. It, yeah, whether that's the right call or not, I don't know. He's obviously he's only twenty games, I think, into his English managerial career. Um, MK Dons are sixth, I believe, in in League One. They're playing some good football. They're they're playing well. Um, obviously, a former Ipswich academy youngster, academy coach, very highly regarded coach. He really really interests me um, because I think. That's kind of the, I think that might be the type that that Mark Ashton wants. I'm not saying this with any understanding that, that he's the man whatsoever, but that that that's what that's what interests me. I think that the young coach who could uh, head up the football side that's what that's what interests me from from this list. There are plenty of others though. Fresh and sexy, I like the sound of that. Um, just looking, there was a poll that you did with the story, Hutchie. So I've just been looking at yep. the results on that while uh, while you've been talking. Tried and tested is the is the most popular in terms of what type of manager would you want. Thirty nine percent say that. Followed thirty four percent by young and hungry. And then in terms of the manager, our old friend Neil Warnock is the favourite of all those names you put. Twenty five percent of people who voted, quarter of them 
have voted for Neil Warnock. Stewie, Neil Warnock, your thoughts? It's kind of always felt like Neil Warnock was destined to manage Ipswich at, at some point. Um, he's, he's one of these managers, and he's probably done it with several clubs, but he's always spoken sort of batted his eyelids, eyelids at Ipswich when he's when he's been here and, you know, spoke spoken about the club in such warm tones, almost as if it's kind of waiting for the opportunity to arise one day. Keep saying he's going to retire, doesn't he? And then uh, it's his wife's name that he always... Re- I can't remember her name. Now. Is it Sharon or Linda? I can't remember. Oh, she, you know, she'll kill me if I do. If I if you keep saying he's going to retire to Cornwall, but then one more gig... I think he's. People said it's almost like he's talking about his last job now being a, a little bit of a, a, a holiday. Is that what? Like he would come in and put a rocket up players' backsides, and he's got a, he's got. Listen, how many promotions has Neil Warnock got on his CV? Be the closest thing if you were doing it on paper to someone that could come in and as close to sort of guarantee you a, a promotion and a and a lift. It's not much of a, a long-term vision going on there, is there? But you could argue that just just get the job done. You know, this is year three in League One for Ipswich now. Just just get them back in the Championship and then cross that bridge hmm. when you get to it. I'm the same as Andy. I, I I would I would be looking at more of a project appointment. I think at the time when when Mick McCarthy left, I looked at the history of and the DNA of this football club, and you look back at people like. Robson and Ramsey and even George Burley, they were they were young men that were, were probably seen as gamble appointments at the time, people who had not long finished playing that hadn't got huge amounts on their CV. That that feels to me that that's what Ipswich is. Liam Manning definitely interests me. He's had a really interesting coaching journey to this point. He knows the club as well. He's uh, you know, I think he's good friends with, with Leo Neal behind the scenes. Will know inside out what this football club's all about. I've chucked someone else in there as a, and this is someone I've just thought of in the last sort of uh, last day or so. Really, is Anthony Barry, who was uh, who's who was Cook, one of Cook's right hand men. Which so this would seem a bit strange that Cook's kind of taken over by one of his former coaches but he had a big role at, at, at Wigan and is, is one of the bright young things in in English football uh, coaching at, at the moment he's 35 years old he's he's already sort of helping Thomas Tuchel out quite a lot at Chelsea he's played a big role in in Ireland's academy or youth set up as well um, someone like that you know you look at Neil Critchley who's gone in at Blackpool from Liverpool under 23s and the job he's done there something sort of fresh and exciting and creative like that is what I, I would like to see Ipswich Town do rather than just dip into a Warnock or you can look through that list, Chris Hewton, Steve McLaren, Chris Coleman, people like that, that no doubt some of those men will be chucking their, their hats in the ring. But um, yeah, I don't know. What's, what's Who your, excites what's, you? What's your mate Maurice Stein doing these days, Stu? It's not gone well for Maurice in, <laughs> uh, in in the years since. Shall we talk about, in terms of excitement, the names that are inevitably going to excite fans and are being chucked around? I think, in fact, on on that poll, um, someone called Mr. Lampard is is second in terms of people who they'd want. Um, and you've got other kind of sexy names, John Terry, etc. When we had this chat on Saturday nights, you and I mentioned runners and riders and Frank Lampard. You got as forceful as you get. You said, I'm not putting that in there. That's nonsense. He's just turned Norwich down. He's not going to come to Ipswich Town. Um, Hutchie, Frank Lampard. That's nonsense. He's just turned <laughs> Norwich down. Um, there's not a lot of evidence to suggest that this is a job that he would he would go for. Um, yes, he's just turned Norwich down in the Premier League. He turned Ipswich down in, in the Championship. Um I'd argue it's probably the Ipswich job is more attractive to someone like Frank Lampard now if he's willing to swallow being a League One mid-table League One football manager from the outset. Um, that's more of a more of a um, attraction for him now potentially than it was in the Championship. But I, I don't know if you're if you're turning down you're turning down Norwich in the Premier League. Yes, they were in trouble, uh, relegation, a real possibility, but you'd then be a real force in the Championship the following the following year. Um, I can't see it, but I can 
I could argue if you wanted me to, I could argue that it would be a good job for him mm. to take um, because there's clearly there's clearly a level of spend here uh, relative to the division certainly, and and there's a long term there's a good long term plan with ownership. So I could um, I could argue that I'd be very surprised if it was, and, and I guess the same would go for people like John Terry, who's who's kind of out of work in search of. His first, he, he left Aston Villa because he wants to go it alone at some point. Mm. Um, I guess the same would apply to him. However, with him though, he, he's never managed before. Like someone like him, I'm sure would be interested in this job. It's a big football club. Um, as first jobs go for former England captains, it's a pretty, pretty attractive one. But again, I don't necessarily think that that's that's where the club will go with it. Mm. Stewie, should we talk about... Oh, you muted yourself. You're going to say something, mate. We don't know how big Ipswich Reach is, do we, at Mm. this moment in time? I think it might be bigger than people would imagine for a League One club. I I think they can can go higher than people would would imagine. Like you say, Lampard is probably at the, the very fingertips of that reach, but the money, the ownership, the size of the club, the project, I think all of those things will mean that they can maybe get someone bigger than than people realize um we'll see i mean it's not impossible that they could tempt somebody in a championship job that to drop down in the same way that they drop players that looked like they would be out of reach of a league one club to the club they could do that with a manager as well i mean it's not impossible Mm. that someone like tony mowbray could be spirited away from blackburn who maybe feels that he's taken blackburn as far as he can this job didn't necessarily appeal to him when marcus evans was here but it's it's a whole whole new kettle of fish mm. now and then and, and the goalposts have changed i'd love tony mowbray to manage ipswich town i really i really would i just it just feels like the stars are never going to align for him there i think they're fourth in the championship at the moment as as much as as much as the ipswich might be attractive for him and and there might be a feeling that you there's only so far you can take blackburn um i think being fourth in the championship is um being fourth in the championship is a is a very big Mm. perch to, to leave to move to the middle of the middle of league one i'd be surprised if it was mowbray but but delighted i, really. I just hope they're open-minded on this appointment and they give everybody if you know they're, they're really open-minded as to what they want to do because there's some obvious names in here that have got links to to ashton and the ownership people like michael appleton who they appointed o'leary and ashton appointed at oxford will have known him from their west brom days uh lee johnson who worked with ashton for years at Bristol City, those two had a big, big bear hug at, the, at one of the games recently. I saw in the director's box. There's clearly a lot of sort of mutual love and respect between those two. Um, if if we're talking about it being too obvious for Cook going for f- all of his former contacts all the time, you could level the same thing at the at those in in the hierarchy. You got just going back to what you know isn't necessarily always always the answer for me. Just, just be open-minded that you're going to have a pick of a lot of uh, attractive candidates. Just Don't just chuck them all in the bin straight away. Have a, have a serious think about uh, you know, what, what you want to do next. Hmm. Is there a family emergency you need to tend to, Stewie? There's, there's, a, few, there's a few calls in the background. <laughs> it's it's solo, solo parenting today, so uh, off goes Stu. <laughs> He'll be back. He'll be back. Uh, Hutchie, in his absence, shall we talk a little bit about the betting odds? Because there are some strange old names on that list that I put yeah. up last night through Bet Victor. There are the, the ones we expected, your, your Lampards, um, your John McGreals, that type of thing. But there are also names right at the top of the list, I might add, like Mark Bircham and Frank Yallop. Your yeah. thoughts on those? Both both of those have got links to ownership. Um, I'm surprised Didier Drogba hasn't so surfaced on the, on some of these. Yeah. You're up for that, are you? I am absolutely up for that. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, both both Frank. Obviously, Frank. Frank, we know. Frank, we know is a is a, a man who played 400 odd games for Ipswich Town, but he also was uh, in the hot seat at Arizona United, which became Phoenix Rising um, under this ownership. They know him. Um, I think Frank's credited with with putting them on to Ipswich in terms of potentially buying buying the club. So um yes, that's where that's where that one's come from. He's in the process of kind of building a new football club in uh I think it's northern <laughs> Northern California. Um that's quite a move to uh, mm. move from from uh, the north of California to Ipswich in December. But he does have uh, 
I think his wife, his wife is from here. I think, and I have family here. So Ipswich is a is a pull to him. Mark Bircham was Frank's assistant at Phoenix Rising. So yep, they're both they're both known to ownership. But I would be, I think I'd be I'd be surprised if they went down down that route. Just someone that the owners had worked with before. Yeah. Um, Frank's a highly decorated coach. At one point, he was. At one point, he was one like the the big name in MLS, sort of um, in various jobs. LA Galaxy, he had San Jose. Um, he's managed the Canadian national team, I think. Um, he was a big deal in kind of US coaching circles. He's clearly a very good coach, but um, I, I would be surprised if that's that's sort of anything other than than bookies kind of reaching for someone to put at the top of their lists because I think it's quite notable as well that you, you mentioned Bet Victor there. They are the, from what I can see, the only ones that are running a market on on who the next Ipswich town manager will be, which um says a lot about where Ipswich are. Um and also and also says a lot about maybe maybe what's gone into making that list. Hmm. Hmm. Stewie, let by bringing it back full circle, we started this chat about what's next talking about the caretaker manager, John McGreal, who we, who we think that's going to be announced today. If John McGill comes in and they win the next couple of games and it gets a bit of momentum going, is it beyond the realms of possibility that John McGreal could end up as the full-time Ipswich Town manager? Who knows? If we go and win at Charlton and at Wigan, who are currently joint top, then... Maybe, maybe they'll just decide that they'll they'll take their time to kind of assess their options and just see what what else is maybe available come the end of the season. I don't know. None of us really know where where their heads are at at, at the moment. Um, I don't think it's impossible at all. If I'm honest, I really don't. I think that could really happen. And if it was McGreal, your first thought, or at least my first thought when I saw the McGreal and where town are at in the kind of process of looking at, you know, upward trajectory and that kind of thing. John McGreal, yes, a great Ipswich Town player, did great things at the club. As a coach, I said he's not got the pedigree surely thereafter. But you pointed out, Stewie, that at Colchester United, he he was he was pretty successful. Yeah, I think it was a a shock when when he left Colchester in 2020. They'd just lost in the, the playoff semi-finals to, to Exeter. I think they'd finished just outside the playoffs. I think one place outside the playoffs twice before that. So I think his four years at Colchester were given the constraints that he was kind of working under where Robbie Cowling was making it clear that they had to sort of produce from, from within. Um, I think he'd done a pretty good job there and, and uh, it was really, I think, only the COVID situation that where they were tightening the purse strings that that meant that he left and and Steve Ball, his assistant, kind of took over. So um, I, I think his his record at Colchester, I think, will be reflected on as a, as a pretty positive one. Um, but whether that is good enough, sexy enough for the uh, for Ipswich Town and, and the new owners. We shall see. I would imagine they, they've got lofty ambitions and I, part of me thinks I think deep down they'll be looking for something, uh, a bigger reach than John McGrill, who was, you know, back in the summer, he was appointed by by Swindon in, in League Two. Obviously, that never got off the ground 31 days in the job and he left because, again, of, of back, you know, decisions, you know, the situation of the club mm. um, being difficult there with the ownership and everything. But you know, there was, it wasn't like he was someone that had championship clubs falling over themselves to get back in the summer. And that's that's probably the level that Ipswich are, are looking at at the moment. But as Andy says, it's not impossible. Stranger things would have happened, could have happened. Um, I guess we'll, we'll see how these next two games go. He's operated as a head coach before. It's, he's, he, I think he, that was his title at Colchester. They've got, for all the budgetary constraints they've got at, at Colchester, I think they've got a pretty serious kind of football set up in terms of like director I don't know what the mm. titles are exactly but in terms of kind of directors of football and recruitment and and things they've got they they've got that in place probably a football structure that uh, that Paul Lambert would have envied when he was <laughs> when he was talking about the structure being all wrong I, I don't think it's impossible at all um um it would be interesting if that happened um and I'd be surprised if it happened but um it's certainly not 
certainly think, not impossible. I think whoever they appoint, a big skill of theirs is going to be someone who can manage up as well as managing down, someone who can fit within that that structure. Um, as Andy said earlier, sort of staying in your lane and and just doing doing your job and focusing on that job. And it would be very interesting if, if it is called manager or, or head coach. Um, you know, it was only a few years ago that Ian Milne, I think, was scoffing at the uh, the Norwich sort of yeah. way of, of Daniel Farker being a head coach and Stuart Webber. And no, we, you know, we believe in the manager being the manager and, you know, we, we leave them to get on with it, the old school style, which would be your sort of your Neil Warnock. And I just wonder, I don't think the dynamic of a Warnock and Ashton would, would work. Um, I think there might have been a bit of butting of heads over the, the Sam Morsey uh, deal before Warnock left at a transfer deadline day as well, which which leads me to think that that, that is unlikely. I would like to see a manager who brings a bum bag full of his own photos, though, to hand out at games. That would be something I'd like to see from uh, from the next town manager. And of course, if it is McGrill Hutchie, you can take that framed picture, that framed shirt behind you um, to to a, the first press conference and get that get that signed, maybe. <laughs> yeah. uh, mate, mate, it already it's, it's already signed. Mate. Oh, it's already from, signed from years and years ago. Okay. Yeah, well, you, can get him to re- you get him to refresh it, maybe. Might have to take. <laughs> I might have to take it down for impartiality reasons. <laughs> All right then, boys, that brings us to 45 minutes. We've talked about what's happened and we've talked about what is maybe happening next. Is there anything else you want to talk about? Obviously, we know Mark Ashton said he's going to be addressing the media today, so we are hoping to hear from him in due course. Um, anything else to mention, Hutchie? Uh, just that they're playing Charlton on Tuesday night. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think if it is John McGreal, um, I'm not sure there's going to be a whole lot of deviation from kind of the systems that we've seen from Paul Cook. I've, looking back through his Colchester teams, it's a good mix of a four-two-three-one um, and and four-four-two. But those four-four-twos play with sort of deep, deep-lying midfielders, pushed-up wingers, and and two strikers. So actually, there's very little difference between John McGrill's four-four-two and and John McGrill's four-two-three-one. Um, so I think it could be a relatively easy trans transition. I don't think there's going to be any reinvention of the wheel in the short. In the short term, I do. I wonder whether Kane Vincent Young may uh, may get a slight new lease of life under the manager who worked with him for so long at Colchester and played him as a left back. Um, mm. So I wonder. I wonder whether we might finally uh, might finally see Kane have a little bash at that in his first game. I think. Uh, I think new managers, be they caretakers or new ones, always want to try something. I think certainly interim caretaker managers always want to try something a little bit different because they've come into post for a reason because things haven't been going well. It's it's easy for them to kind of experiment in the short term. I remember Brian Clue sort of changing to, to three at the back when he, I think, came in post post Mick at the end of, of that season. I think two up front is, a, is an easy win going to Charlton. And the thought of Joe Piggott and Macaulay Bond, both former Charlton players, sort of both playing up, up front. Uh, Piggott, I think, feels that he was let go a little bit too soon, wasn't given a fair crack of the whip at Charlton. He's clearly frustrated and fired up, I think. Macaulay Bond looked like someone, one of the few players that had a bit of fire in his belly at the weekend. He's desperate to kind of end his goal drought. We know he bleeds blue. I think that, that could be an easy win to up front. Vincent Young is certainly someone that the door may reopen for, as An- as Andy says. And and with Kieran Dyer being involved, or we think is going to be involved, then maybe there's a left field sort of player from the 23s come, come into it. Cameron Humphreys, I thought, came on and made a real impact at, at the weekend. Where you'd play him, I don't know. He's a central midfielder. They've tried him at left back for the, for the 23s. He's quite versatile. But if not starting, someone like him might suddenly sort of come in come into things as well so uh, Idris El Mazzouni is someone that, that Kieran loves for the 23s as well I'm sure he'd be uh he'd be sort of championing his cause so um yeah I think there'll be there'll be one or two little tweaks they might try something a little bit different and there's no doubt about it they'll have 3,000 plus traveling Ipswich fans fully behind them on Tuesday night tomorrow night Mm. It's a valid point, isn't it, Hutchie? I mean, you know, obviously they you said they are oh by the way, they are playing tomorrow and they're playing at Charlton and then they're at Wigan this weekend. These are these are big games for Ipswich Town in terms mm-hmm. of the scheme of the whole season. Take away whatever's happening with the manager. Ipswich Town need points, they need wins, they need yeah. results. And they can't just afford to go, well, we haven't got a manager at the moment. They've got to get something out of out of these next two games, haven't they? Yeah. And it, obviously that Sunderland it's a it's a huge time for the club, generally. Yeah, it's a massive, massive period. And now it's become a massive period in, in the boardroom as well. And the decision mm. decisions that are made there, yeah, it's huge. Um 
you'll know a lot more about the direction of, of short term and long term direction of Ipswich. But by the time they finish that Sunderland game on the 18th, I think it, they could have nine points in the bag and right be be right on it with a new with a new man in charge head into 2022 at the highest level of optimism. Or um, or you could be could be thinking about 2022 almost being kind of like the rebuild section before really going for it next season. It's um yeah, yeah it's a big old period of games and and decisions. Uh, it's worth mentioning as well that there's no we don't think Edmondson will be available. That was mm-hmm. one of the last things that Paul Cook told us at the weekend that George Edmondson, who was named Player of the Month ahead of the game, missed out with an Achilles issue. I always shudder when I hear the word Achilles because they can be ticking time bombs, but um, don't know if he's if he's going to be fit. You would think that that's that's unlikely for tomorrow night. He's been their most informed player. That that worries me. Selena as well missed out with an unknown injury. I am looking forward actually to finding out who which players are actually injured and when they're coming back. That was, <laughs> we, where's, we, Hayden, <laughs> where's Hayden Colson? We might get an answer. Yeah. yeah. So I mean that that's two two key players obviously that Ipswich are missing going into these games. But the options are plentiful as we've discussed before. They they still should have enough to uh, to get a decent team out on that pitch and hopefully with a with a with an added little bit of fire in the belly, an added bit of motivation to uh, impress whoever's watching from afar. Uh, let's hope that they can they can start this week in the right way against Charlton and, and carry some something up to, to Wigan, who, um, who, uh, who are obviously uh, going well. So I want at least three points from these next two games, if hopefully more. But I think three points from these two would give potentially the new man uh, something to work with going into the games ahead. Hmm. Certain irony, isn't it, to the fact that Paul Cook went out as well playing four four two on Saturday uh, in, in his last formation as a switch town manager. Hutchie, you've you've coined such great um, phrases as a win is better than a loss, and you can't win unless you score goals. So you should surely be in the betting odds for next six weeks town manager. Give me some final words, Hutchie, as we as we look to wrap this up. Um, your thoughts on the whole situation? Biggest decision. Of Mark Ashton's made yet will be just just a huge huge decision. It feels like this is the real statement of intent. Time for the new ownership and the new management. Time time to show your true hand and and just show what where you see Ipswich Town going and, yeah. and how and how you're going to achieve it. I tell you what, we talked about it being an attractive proposition. That that might put some off as well. You think, crikey, that's. Uh... If that's where the sort of this ownership's tipping point is, that Paul Cook, a manager of his caliber, only got twenty games after rebuilding his squad, does that maybe put a doubt in some people's minds? I, I don't know. You would hope that every, all the good stuff about this job out, outweighs that, but that's an interesting dynamic, isn't it? Indeed. Okay, we'll, we'll wrap it up there, boys. We're just coming up to the hour there. Whatever you say about Ipswich Town this season, you can certainly not say it's ever dull. Um, please support our sponsor, Manscaped, by using the code KOA at manscaped.com for 20% off and free delivery. Leave us a five-star review on iTunes because that helps us get visibility in the charts and more people can see us, and it's a good time for people to be seeing us, obviously. Uh, and also follow us, Kings of Anglia, across all the social medias on uh, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. Um, there we go, then. Paul Cook has gone. The Demolition Man is now part of that rubble. Again, trademark Stuart Watson. You like that line, don't you? I, I bloody love it, mate. When I read it yesterday, I had a little, hmm, oh, yes. Lovely that was. Um, very, very good indeed. He, he's gone though. A new era again is about to begin at Ipswich Town. We will be with it, following it all through the roller coaster ride at Portman Road. And stick with us because who knows where we're going to be going next. We'll speak to you next time.